In chapter six, we will be studying gases and how they interact. Um, gases have compressibility, which is their main difference between solids and liquids, is that we are introducing a new variable called pressure. Now, pressure can change with the volume, the temperature, um, and also the number of gas moles, and we'll be talking about all of that. So first, we have this kinetic molecular theory of gases, basically four postulates which outline how gases behave. And the first being the particles of gases are constantly moving, and they're constantly moving in straight lines. They move pretty fast. So the average kinetic energy of the particles are directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature. And that's what temperature is. It's a representation of the average kinetic energy of the gas molecules. The second postulate, the attraction between particles are negligible. This is true because gases have little intermolecular forces with each other, meaning they don't like to interact. They're inert and they bounce off each other elastically. Three, when the moving gas particles hit another gas particles or the container, they do not stick, but they bounce off and continue moving. This means, again, they, are, they do not have interact with each other and they are elastic, these collisions. And they're colliding all the time. The fourth one, there is a lot of empty space between the gas particles compared to their size. Their volume is negligible, meaning the hydrogen gas molecule, which is H2, a lot smaller than O2, is a particle that would have the same volume speaking in a in the ideal gas sense meaning that we can consider them to be the same even though they're clearly not the same size we can consider them to be the same size because the distance between them in any given time is so large that their individual volumes are negligible so we have this new variable called pressure Pressure is force per unit area, but we look at pressure in a different way using the, our equations, our gas laws, PV equals NRT, and our combined gas law, which we'll cover in a minute. So the units for pressure, we have ATM, MMHG, Tor, and Pascal. Here's the conversions for all of them. Volume, milliliters and liters, we've seen that before. The amount is N, is the number of gas moles. The temperature is always Kelvin. Always convert your Celsius temperatures to Kelvin. Um, and then we have our three laws, Boyle's Law, Charles Law, Avogadro, and also the combined gas law, which combines those three. Then we have the ideal gas law, which has a set units based on the R value. The R constant is the ideal gas constant, which is in liter ATM per Kelvin mole. This should be Kelvin to the negative one and mole to the negative one, so per Kelvin mole. So this means that our, our, our volume should be in liters, our pressure in ATM, our temperature in Kelvin, and our N is going to be in the moles of gas. So here are the gas laws. So Boyle's law has an inverse proportionality to or with uh, pressure and volume, meaning if the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. So if you decrease the volume of a piston, and the gas inside is going to have more pressure. Charles's law, the direct proportionality between volume and temperature, meaning if you increase the temperature you will increase the volume. So the gas will want to move faster. Assuming that we keep the same pressure at a constant pressure, the only way to keep a constant pressure and increase the temperature is if the volume of the gas increases because it will expand the container, such as a balloon going from being colder to hotter. Or a basketball, if you have it in the cold, it will kind of deflate, or if it's hot, it will inflate. Gay-Lussac's law. This one's not really covered in this chapter, but it's important to mention also because the pressure has a direct proportionality to temperature at a constant volume. So if you have a car tire, which has a constant volume, let's just say the tire's sitting on the just tires there, it's not really changing volume. But if you increase the temperature of the tire, the air pressure will increase. This is Gay-Lussac's law. The combined gas law combines all three of these relationships. And then the ideal gas law introduces the moles. So this Boyle's Law, you can see if you decrease the volume by increasing the force that you're putting down on the piston, this will increase the pressure. There's Charles's Law, the example with the balloon. If you have the molecules moving at a low kinetic energy in a cold environment versus a warmer environment, the molecules will move faster and the volume will expand. Here's Avogadro's Law, another one that, um, that is also covered that we have a direct proportionality between volume and moles. So it would be V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. And this is true because think about pumping up a basketball, right? If you have 
a constant volume, or sorry, if you have a, a lower volume and it's uh, infl deflated, if you keep pumping up the basketball, you are introducing more gas moles, so your N is going to increase. Therefore, your volume will increase as well. There's a combined gas law. The ideal gas law is PV equals NRT. This R constant will be given to you, 0 0.8206, liter ATM per Kelvin mole. It's important to have these units, liter, ATM, and Kelvin, and mole. So that's going to be your equation for that. We have another R value when we're introducing joules and also kinetic energy, and uh, we're going to see that later on. So here's a summary of the laws again. So the average molecular velocity. Now we have this root mean square velocity. This represents the speed of the gas particles. Now there's two things we need to remember. These are two key concepts. One, all gases in our, all ideal gases have the same kinetic energy. How can this be possible? Well, if you have smaller gases such as hydrogen and helium, they will move faster than heavier gases like oxygen and nitrogen. So what this means is that our average kinetic energy is one half mv squared, right, according to physics. And this is the same thing. One half the times m is going to be your molar mass. v squared is this u squared. What that means is that if a smaller gas is present, the mass will be low, but the velocity will be high. If a heavier gas is present, the mass will be high and the velocity will be low. This means that our kinetic energies will be equal. So heaviers move slower, lighters move faster. And that means even though the kinetic energy is the same, the velocity will obviously not be. So now diffusion and effusion, important concepts, that diffusion of gases means you are moving the gas from a high concentration to a low or high pressure to a low pressure. Effusion is um, the rate at which the gas moves through a tiny porous hole, such as a, uh, in a vacuum. So one side is going to be a vacuum, meaning you have a high pressure and a low pressure. So the high pressure gas in the left chamber, they're going to move, the particles are going to move one by one almost to the right chamber based on that tiny porous hole. And the rate of effusion is dependent on the molar mass. So the rate of gas one divided by the rate of gas two equals the square root of the molar mass of gas two over the molar mass of gas one. That's an important equation. This will be given to you, but it's important to know how to, how to interpret it. Because if we have gas one, or gas A, is hydrogen, and gas B is oxygen, this means that the square root of the molar mass of B, meaning O2, is gonna be 32, divided by the square root of H2, which is uh, two molar mass. That means 32 over two is 16, square root of 16 is four. This means that the rate of effusion of hydrogen is four times the rate of effusion of oxygen. So we also have this condition called STP, which is our standard temperature pressure. So whenever STP is written there, you think 1 ATM, 273 Kelvin. Very important. Based on that, you can plug it into PV equals NRT and determine the liters or the volume for one mole of an ideal gas, which is 22.4 liters. This number will not be given to you and is an important one to know. So you automatically know one liter of a gas at STP, um, excuse me, one mole of a gas at STP is 22.4 liters. So if they ask you what is the volume of 0.5 moles of a gas at STP, you could just do 0.5 times 22.4. We can then use this number to figure out our density at STP. So you can just take the molar mass of a gas, divide it by your molar volume at STP, meaning 22.4, to determine the density. So for helium, it would be 4 grams per mole, divided by 22.4 liters, and the density at STP would be 0 0.179 grams per liter. If we have mixtures of gases, such as the air, the air has nitrogen 78%, oxygen 21%, argon 0.9%, carbon dioxide 0.4%, we can add up these percents, they will equal 100. This also means that we can take our total pressure, which let's say in the atmosphere is 1 atm, and multiply it by the percents to determine your partial pressure. So nitrogen, 78%, that means if we assume 1 atm for the environment, then 78 times 1 is, or 0.78 times 1 is, 0.78. So that means our partial pressure for nitrogen is 0.78. And these 
partial pressures can be added together to determine the total pressure. This is called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. Simple. The pressure of gas A plus B plus C equals the total pressure. We can then take this a step further and determine the mole fraction. Since we could assume that all of these gas molecules behave similarly and the, independent of their size, they, both take, they all take up the same amount of volume, that all the gas particles act the same. This means that we can determine the total moles by the total pressure and therefore using the partial pressure and that percentage of abundance in that sample, we can determine the mole fraction. So for example, going back, this nitrogen, 78%, we know that the mole fraction in the entire gas is 78%. We can then use that to multiply by any pressure. So not just one ATM. What if this atmosphere was three ATM? That means we would take three times the 0.78, because 0.78 would be the mole fraction. And it's also the percent by volume. So they're the same thing because we could assume all these gases behave the same. So we can say that 0.78, times our three ATM would be whatever that is, and that would be around two point something, that would be our partial pressure for nitrogen. So again, these partial pressures could be added together, and the mole fraction could be multiplied by the, par the, by the total pressure to come up with our partial pressure. You could then figure out total pressure from a gas sample by knowing the, by ga in a gas mixture, by knowing the mixture components. So for this example, you have 12.5 liters, that's our V. We have a tank that has 12, uh, 24.2 grams of helium, 4.32 grams of oxygen at 298. You have your temperature as well. So if you figure out the moles of each of the helium gas and the oxygen gas, you could then add up those moles. That's your total N. Using PV equals NRT, you can figure out the pressure. You can then use the mole fractions, which you can find by since you have the moles of each helium and oxygen, you could then take those moles, divide them by the total moles to come up with your mole fraction down here. You can see that, that we do that down here. And then we can multiply that mole fraction by the total pressure. The total pressure found by PV equals NRT was 12.1. We could then multiply each of our mole fractions by 12.1 to come up with our partial pressures of each of the gases. So real gases. So the ideal gas behavior is true at low pr pressures and low temperatures. And it also it assumes that there are no interactions between the gas molecules, which is generally true. But at higher pressures, I'm talking hundreds of ATM, some of these rules fall apart a bit. So a lot of this real gas behavior um, can be simplified by PV equals NRT. But in reality, we use this van der Waals equation, which is PV equals NRT with some, con with, some, with some correction factors. So we have this P plus A times N over V squared and this V minus N times B. So these, we know what everything is here. The only thing that we haven't seen before, are this A and B constant. Now this A and B constant are a trait for each individual gas. And th there's a table with some common van der Waals constants. So we can plug these in and we can come up with our real gas behavior at a certain pressure and temperature. The only thing that's important to know is, well, we, will, we might see this equation, and you might have to use it if it's given, and you will be given these A and B constants, which should be pretty easy to do. But it's important to know that what these A and B constants represent. So A represents the correction for the intermolecular forces, which we haven't covered intermolecular forces, but this basically means that the, it's the, the, the interaction between the molecules themselves. So if A is large, that means there's going to be, on average, a larger interaction with, um, between the gas molecules. So for example, carbon dioxide and CCL4, these have a larger A value compared to a lot of the noble gases because they have a larger amount of interaction between each other, which is still not much interaction compared to other molecules, but in the gas world, it's considered a good amount of intermolecular forces. So this needs to be corrected for. So that's what our A represents. And it is a correction to the pressure. Our, our B constant represents the correction to the volume because it's V minus NB. So these B values are also on the right. 
and this is due to the particle volume. So helium, the smaller gases, will have a smaller volume. The larger gases will have a larger volume. Therefore, the B value will be high. So we can use this equation in many ways, but it will only come up not many times. So here's how these real gases deviate from the ideal gas assumption, the ideal gas in this kind of magenta color, and then the other gases you see at extremely high pressures, 200, 400, up to 1,000 atm, they deviate um, about 10, 20, 30 percent away from our normal PV over RT. So that's about it. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to comment on the video. And also, give these gas problems a try uh, when you're looking at this video. Um, it'll help you reaffirm the concepts and, and get better at this subject. So um, with that, you can subscribe, like the video, and good luck this semester.